there are two players that can be uh, classified as successful disappointments. Shaq is one of them. A very great player had the ability to be the greatest ever. And yet he settled for mediocrity. Was it mediocrity? Mediocrity? Whatever the fuck. You get what the fuck I'm saying. Uh, Could have easily been the greatest ever. Could have had at least six or seven titles if he if he had the mindset of the greats. If he had the mindset of Kobe. If he had the mindset of, of Larry Bird. You know what I'm saying? Uh, Matt, Michael Jordan, uh, he, he would be the greatest ever, and I hope everybody knows that. Once he is, I, I, don't, I don't know, but the, the vibe I get from him, once his, what, ah, nah, no, he, 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 it was a period in time where he, he was just unstoppable, nobody could stay in front of him, but, um, it seems like, he didn't really put the effort in to evolve with the game. Tells me that he didn't really love it. You see what I'm saying? So I lose respect for players like this. I'm being real. Um, but yeah, before we get nah, let me uh let me read it first. Shaquille O'Neal power uh in a in agility made him nearly unstoppable. Before we get started, make sure you like, comment, and subscribe. Help me get to t 320. We are seven away. And let's get this bit to a cool five likes, my brothers. In the last two episodes, we've seen two-way big men dominate in the golden oh, era of center. Shit. But the last Goliath of that era was the biggest, Shaquille O'Neal. I got Hakeem. Hakeem to me is better than Was him. quite simply the most physically Damn. overpowering athlete in the history of basketball oh, or maybe any sport. He was more nimble than players he outweighed by 100 pounds. And at his apex, there was far more to his game than just bullying people under that's, the rim. That's the vibe but I got, were those being other honest. Pieces? And were they enough to make him the best offensive big man ever? Bruh, no. He's not better than Will. He's not better than Bill Russell. Come on, bro. He's not. Uh, him and Tim Duncan not in the same category. Let me see who else I got over this him. This series tackles one question. He's not who better than Hakeem. At his best. Hey, come on, man. We start at the ABA merger and go through the best multi-year stretches. Kareem. He's not better than Kareem. The most I forgot it here, bro. These are the greatest peaks. That's crazy. I'm not gonna lie, that's insane. When he entered the league in 1993, Shaq was already a 300 plus pound physical marvel. Before O'Neal, Wilt Chamberlain was the benchmark for power on the court. But Shaq took things to a whole new right. level. Will is better than him. After his rookie season, they actually needed to Shaq proof the baskets. And by his peak years in Los Angeles, he tipped the scales at around 340 pounds. Christ. His power game actually started without the ball. We rarely think of off ball movement like this, but O'Neal created advantages by working for an extra three or four feet that made all the difference. With the ball on the wing, Shaq flashes to the post but is doubled, so moving it to the top creates an easier entry. And notice O'Neal sit down and drive backwards at an angle to get deeper. Same position here, only Reggie Miller sags to prevent a pass to Shaq, but O'Neal sneaks a step or two closer to the goal, and so when it's swung to the corner, Shaq again seals himself deeper to set up a dunk. This was decidedly Isn't different that than basic Wilt, basketball. Who parked himself in a spot and waited in a fairly upright position for an entry. Right here, he could seal Bill Russell under the rim, but in general, he wasn't looking for positional advantages like this. And well, some of this is specific to an era with less bully ball in general. Yeah, it's and that's another thing. Go check out my recent video. The, I, I never knew this. They couldn't use no arms, nothing, or it was an offensive foul. So, yeah, that has also another key. So, he was, he was kind of forced not to be as aggressive as Shaq. Just imagine if he was given the leeway of Shaq. 
Bro, he would low key be the greatest of all time. Philosophy. When Shaquille moved across the lane, he was trying to get closer to the rim. Wilt would move more toward the ball. He doesn't duck in front of his man, but instead flashes to a spot like a finesse player. You see him with no elbow versus, at all? For example. This is okay that was a position, rule. but changing sides allows Shaq to get a quarter step and then chisel out a much deeper catch, and that's unstoppable. To prevent O'Neal from getting that step, savvier defenders took away his cut, but then reversing sides opened a new door because he was such a Jeez, massive target. Christ. These counters are similar to perimeter players cutting back door on yeah. the overplay. Only Shaq's counters were about grappling for position in the paint, and he's sprightly enough to make catches like this. If teams tried to overplay the baseline, he could spin out the other side for the lob. Remember, his defender is worried about Shaq getting inside that low leg to the baseline, where it's game over if he seals him off. Yet, O'Neal's quick enough to punish that overplay in an instant with those light tap dancing feet. This is some basketball jujitsu, feeling more weight on his right leg and then rolling off to go time up the lob. This explosive yeah, stuff, I'm not right athleticism is often overlooked in Shaq. Moving but quickly. Miss, at like, bro, who is this Muggsy Bogues? Like, come on. Oblique it's not angle fair. Was the basis of He's getting game. obliterated. Like, bro, it's not close. Game. He would drive through his victims from the hips to overpower them with angles. Like, who Will is that? Have that same low base explosiveness to spin or pirouette quite like O'Neal. His footwork was stiffer and he lacked he a handle dribble. to set yeah. up these moves. Whereas Shaq's agility combined with his weight carved out so many of his easy buckets. Mm. Shaq unleashed yeah. violence from the floor with his trunk and massive lower but it was body. All, bro, it's, that's a lot to do with it too though. It was also because of that rule, bro. He, he couldn't be aggressive at all. He could probably not. It's not that he couldn't be aggressive. It was just that was definitely hindering. Tess said he was sensitive to being seen about, as uh, a mere Will. brute at the time. But oh Shaq leaned God. into this my power as a way to killed it. before he Oh, killed. no, no, Chamberlain no. was strong enough to have this effect, too. Moving players with his lower body. But it wasn't the norm for him like it was Shaq, who bullied players onto their heels like a basketball Yokozuna. Turning his only game. Tim Duncan into a pinata to set up this drop step. That's his because only his game, bro. Just back down, people. Our ranching spirit. Runs yeah, no bag. Know. Literally just bully ball. O'Neal had some finesse too. He's setting up the drop step, but Dikembe Mutombo stays square with him, so Shaq switches to the fade. Oh shit! He had that bag. Move for him for years, often spinning to the baseline like this. Wow! And because of his seven and a half foot wingspan and jumping ability, he could fire this over giant defenders like Arvita Sabonis. Seriously, man. He also crazy. had surprising range on this shot, not quite to the foul line. We'll get to that in a minute, but out to about twelve or thirteen feet. Wow! While he Seriously. liked the drop step or that little turnaround to his right. He also had a jump hook over the other shoulder. He's denied here on his cut across the lane, which triggers that ball reversal. But Dale Davis stays with him well, and Shaq just falls back on a huge jump hook. A green it bean casserole. Was sky hook. Shaq thought that shot was uncool, but it was hard to defend given his size and speed off the floor. Duh. Between his hooks, powerful spins, and fadeaways, Shaq was an all-time great playoff scorer. Wow. At his peak, he posted some of the best adjusted numbers in league history, trailing only Michael Jordan in number of stretches at this volume and doing so on similar efficiency. I do think Shaq added a different dimension with his off-ball game. He racked up nearly 750 makes from close range in his MVP season, wow. an outlier since those records have been kept back to 1997, and about two thirds of those shots were assisted by teammates, wow. which lands him between the 75th and 80th percentile historically. During the Lakers three-peat, Shaq didn't even attempt a shot outside of 15 feet in the playoffs, and nearly half of his shots came right at the rim. 
So he lived off a diet of the highest percentage attempts in the sport. He added even more value without the ball as an offensive rebounder. His low post positioning battles organically segued into offensive rebounding position. Here comes that cut across the lane. It's jammed nicely, but Jackson lingers to double Shaq. So now Sam Perkins has to help off him and the bull is loose in the China shop. Hmm? Some of his prowess on the glass was just wedging himself near the hoop and out jumping people. His 7-7 wingspan helped here, and so did his incredible springiness <laughs> for someone that size. Bro, they about to kill up this him. That's with the sledgehammer. Again, check out his feet on this play and how his twinkle toes let him reset into a bunny hop multiple times. It was almost unfair to be so nimble at that size, and boxing him out was unenviable, and the Shaq proof Jesus basket works. Christ. Teams tried all kinds of tactics. In the 2000 Western Finals, Portland went with Man, the tag team bro. holding oh, method, my. but even those kinds of tricks weren't foolproof. Okay, that's not right. Let me hear you say, that ain't right. That ain't right. You still can't do shit. Right. That Blazers team was really the only defense to slow down O'Neal during the three P years, swarming him regularly behind the giant Arvidas Sabonis. Oh my who was God! Foot three That's a and travel. He just behind walked. the giant Arvidas Sabonis, who was about He's seven walking. foot three and three hundred pounds himself. Sabonis had the saying? mass to keep Shaq from completely overpowering him, and the basketball IQ to overplay that baseline move he loved. See what I'm saying? You put somebody who can actually stop him, he becomes useless. Cause I'm pretty if I'm not tripping, Kobe was the MVP of this of this series. Kobe was the MVP of this series, and I want to say of the Pacers series. So he yeah. also tried to deny Shaq's cut across the lane, making him catch it three or four feet farther out, and that makes a difference versus the diesel. Like, bro, he's useless. A more realistic way to slow Shaq down was to foul him. There's the traditional method where he's in close, Dang or yeah. the legendary hack shack where teams intentionally fouled him at the end of the quarter. It often felt like Shaq was playing on a Nerf hoop, and the downside of that was at the line he shot a Nerf ball. I've never understood how deliberately fouling a 53% free throw shooter was a winning play. That would be great half-court offense back in those days. Although when Shaq was powering up next to the hoop, 53% was way better than the 75% or so he shot at the rim. Because of this, he put entire front lines into foul trouble, forcing playoff teams to keep Damn. unskilled Ooh. bruising he violent, on dog. We'll say that. just to buy minutes against him. He is like violent. So Shaq's attack warped the entire game like few players ever have, but were the other elements enough to make him the best center ever? <sighs> Bro, he's not the best center. He could have been. He could have been. But he's not at all. He could have been a hundred percent, but no, he's not. Birthday present, Shaquille O'Neal, who turns twenty-seven tomorrow. Not bad. That's it from the forum. I'm Lauren Sanchez. Back to you. Part of the benefit of Shaq's know, positional man. sparring is that it led to quick hitting catch and shoot plays, or, in his case, maybe I should say catch and dunk plays. And by scoring immediately, he didn't take away many opportunities from teammates by monopolizing the ball. If Shaq wasn't in a position to catch and go, one card he could play was the repost, giving the ball up to find that superior position without dribbling. This was a natural bridge between his scoring and playmaking, where if he felt a double team in these spots, he quickly kicked it out and could repost. But if that didn't lead to deeper position, He'd play the same yeah. game again. He was quite patient in these situations, waiting for defenses to commit to blitzing him, and he would move it to the direction the help came from to Catch. punish them. If the double dropped down from the top, Shaq surveyed and comfortably tossed it back out to a teammate. If it came from the opposite corner, right away he looked to that corner, and in general, he was really good at attacking the location of a double team. Allen Iverson doubles off a different Laker and Shaq right. gashes Allen, it. Allen, what are you going to do? Up the play himself what are you going to do? Rebounding. 
Like, it could be real. He could work his way through progressions, on, too. Man. Here's a double from the top, but New Jersey shifts its defense to take away the basic kick out. So Shaq looks to the cutter, and that's picked up Spin well, move, which man, leads the what? skip pass to the opposite wing. Okay. Notice how he swivels his head when he catches an entry, so he can see the action unfolding and find the optimal the pass, play. That's tough. And his processing speed in these spots was quite strong. He spots the double before he lands here, and then holds the defender with a no-look pass. Again, watch his head. Before the ball hits his hands, he's surveying the floor, so he knows the lane is open if his cutter has half a step and hooks up Robert Ory with perfect touch on a bounce That's pass. That's a good pass, too. Shaq was willing to try tighter passes in the paint like this. He sends this to open space in the middle oh, of the lane tough. with wow. a little hop and a soft touch. Shaq was right-hand dominant as a passer, treating the basketball like a dodgeball, and that led to some limitations or awkward deliveries at times. Is that he would a Derek Fisher? Throw one too hot or miss his target like this. Although he also had some brilliant deliveries too. This looks like a skip pass, but it's a changeup that drops oh, wow. perfectly to a cutter. And on this play, he sees Iverson fall asleep, and those giant hands make this touch pass an easy touch. bucket. That's tough. Some speedy neurological processing also helped him audible at times. He's flowing into a catch and shoot here but switches to a pass at the last second after spotting a double. And as Coach Bird can attest to, that is just too good. For my money, yes. Shaq is the best Very familiar with that. among the great 90s centers. Seriously. But there were some holes in his vision. He could miss openings on the opposite block. He threads it once he sees Horace Grant, but a great pass Man. arrives two seconds earlier. Here's that same action again over Shaq's left shoulder, and he's blind to it. And this is a connection that excellent post passers make most of the time. Similarly, he could also miss the baseline cut from the same side of the court. And I think this is the trade-off of conditioning himself to spot the double team instead of holistically reading the floor. To spot the double team. I mean, court. wait, that's a risk. Isn't that is risky though? Wouldn't that be risky? Maybe not, but he's watching it. Of conditioning himself Maybe not. to spot the double team instead of holistically reading the floor. He misses the easy layup here, but is quick to hit a spot up shooter. Since he was quick to react to doubles, his teammates had some wide open threes. Okay. This is similar to what we saw last episode with Akeem's Rockets where surrounding him with capable okay. shooters punished double teams and dotting the arc with these players and even a stretch four optimized Shaq's inside out outside of a white hot playoff run in 2001 those lakers were never really a good okay. three-point shooting team but they had enough respectable shooters on the court to space the floor and keep defenses honest, which allowed a more defensively hey, slanted supporting Too cast far, to play off Shaq while maintaining those offensive heights. As a result, LA's attacks were very good in the regular season and all-time good in the playoffs, able to maintain their regular season efficiency against those super stingy playoff defenses of that era because almost no one had a way to slow down these Shaq-centric offenses. With Shaq on the bench, the Lakers' playoff offensive rating dropped by nearly 12 points wow. during those three-peat runs to about 98 points per 100. Your father knows about saving money. Everything I'm wearing, I've had since boot camp. Even a young Kobe Bryant couldn't carry that kind of roster with a replacement <gasps> level center. Yeah, hey, Kobe! Although Froby was a great fit next yes, to he Lee, was. he was already an elite offensive wing who yes, could play make and generate his own shots. With Shaq probing for position, teams were less likely to throw defensive attention toward Kobe, who already had a bevy of okay. isolation Great. scoring moves on, to unleash. Man. And because of Shaquille's off-ball activity, he didn't take away many touches from Bryant. Okay. O'Neal yes, fit incredibly well next to penetrators like this, because his defenders were so reluctant to leave him near the hoop, 
and this gave Kobe a little more airspace when attacking. <laughs> when Biggs were forced to help, it freed up Shaq on the glass for cleanup duty. Holy what a flying, ridiculous bro. duo they were. I also think there was a strong fit on defense, especially when Bryant was at his defensive peak in the year 2000. Seriously. What the fuck? Shaq could Ooh. be statuesque what at the times, hell? not venturing far from the lane and often dropping deep on pick and rolls, and Kobe's ability to chase ball handlers over screens, and at times hound One of guards the greatest point perimeter of attack, defenders short of, of all time. stationary defense. Uh, don't quote me on that. could be I'm stuck just being in biased. neutral for entire possessions. He stretched that three second rule on both ends. And despite Kobe's ball denial on Iverson here, they still give up an open jumper. Come on, bro. They're there like... were a bunch of reasons why Shaq just camped out in the key a lot. First, Tired. His defensive strength was protecting the rim, uh. especially against smaller wings who challenged his massive frame and his giant reach. Oh, nah. Fuck what and I said, when he was loaded up and in position to contest, he could get to shots like this quickly. Damn. Second, oh he was God. conserving energy. It takes a lot right. to move 340 pounds around the court, and Shaquille was asked to play 43 minutes per game in the playoffs at his peak, and in his condition, he lacked the motor to do that while stepping out to the perimeter on defense, or even sitting down in a stance and moving more in tight spaces. Oh, fucking man. This there were a so number of instances where he was slow getting back in transition, jogging down the court at a leisurely pace, and in some instances, he never really made it back into the play. And in their playoff matchups, the Kings had some success running him until fatigue kicked in. Come on, bro. Also, like this, Shaq this. parked himself in the paint because his change of direction wasn't swift enough to make recovering easy. And he wasn't fast enough to help down from the outside like the last two centers in this series. So he would be useless in today's, in today's NBA. He would be useless. He didn't even try to develop his game. And that's why he fizzled out in the league. Bro, he is, in my opinion, bro, he's the most disappoint successful disappointment. It's two, it's two players that's in this category. Him and KD only. Uh, KD, what if he stayed on OKC and got um, natural championships? And him, what if he locked it, like really, really locked in? And actually strive for perfection, like Kobe and, and Michael Jordan, bro. This nigga would be the best ever, like ever, and I stand on it. it players like this are just disappointments to me, bro. On like, offense, it pisses me off he watching could dictate them where all real. that mass went, but having to react on defense wasn't as easy. He's not agile enough to toggle around here smoothly and kind of bear hugs his man and ends up on the wrong side of the play. All this was compounded by inconsistent awareness, where on some plays he was a bit slow to read potential threats. Come on, you're not even trying! Damn, bro, this shit's getting me mad. Like, this shit's really getting me mad, bro. And He's not even trying! At the wheel with a play unfolding in Jeez, front of him. Like, oh my. This shows up when we look at how opposing teams shot at the rim when O'Neal was on the court. Opponents shot slightly worse than average in 2000, and at exactly average in 2001, which is a far cry from elite defensive big men like the Spurs Twin Towers or the Georgetown Centers. On the plus side, teams didn't take too many of these high percentage shots in the restricted area, against O'Neal, he was even a elite defender, right? In other words, there was some benefit to him lingering in the lane. Many opponents didn't oh, want to challenge Jack shot blocking or take the physical punishment he could dish out on hard fouls. On occasion, he would shift into fifth gear and string together really active defensive possessions, leaving the paint, moving his feet, and giving us a glimpse at what his defense would have looked like with a high revving motor. Of course, Absolutely. most of the time he roamed this around the lane like a grazing bro. elephant, so teams with jump shooting big men would punish him on the perimeter. Shaq did not want to switch onto wings and was reluctant to come out on them. He don't want to get saw like help like... and leads to a clean three, and teams would uh, go at him in pick and roll. 
leaving his teammates on an island against the screener and ball handler, and Shaq's reluctance to venture out helped Allen Iverson in his famous 2001 outburst, and the ultimate example Three of was Mike Never Bibby's pull-up jumper parade in the 2002 Western Man. Finals that Ugh. nearly unseated the Lakers. This also made it really easy for big men to pick and pop their way into wide open jumpers. So when teams started torching LA like this, they would bring Shaq that up to the level of the screen where he could contest pull-ups. This was actually a major tactical adjustment in that big game seven comeback in 2000 against Portland. And there's one of those high energy defensive possessions. Note that most of these shots then were long twos because there weren't many pull-up three practitioners in the league at that point. In 2000 and 2001, the Lakers posted a 103 defensive rating without Shaq on the court, slightly ahead of league average. With him, they were about two points better and more complex adjustments for teammates and opponent quality view him as a solid positive on defense in those seasons, although not a star. Uh, just, we just, see a similar just a, just a good at, defensive presence at his missed games the Fuck same it. method we uh, used back in episode God, two so we're in 25 contests as the only starter missing la was almost a 500 team but when no Shaq shame. returned to the lineup they played at a 62 win pace nice. most of that change was on offense equally as impressive is how the lakers fared without kobe in those years in 29 games where he was the only starter missing LA played at a 54 win pace okay. with an offense nearly three points ahead of the league. Okay. And that's, that's without this. a playmaker replacing Bryant, a testament to Shaq's offensive floor raising yeah, wow. with a three and D roster. Wow, a... Similarly, one number impact metrics Just rank him among the Westbrook, rates, primarily because of his offensive value. To me, there's enough value from that paint protection for him to be a decently positive defender. He was even somewhat effective as a man defender during those years, just based on his size and sheer athleticism. And the overall nature of his offense, which was off ball, quick hit, and so difficult to slow down. Spacing first? Wait, is this good? First percentile? I've never heard of that. Um, is that like really bad? Passing, efficiency, scoring rate, 99th, that's crazy. Made him unique among the- low 89th, all-time level interior scorer, good posted passer, or post passer to cutters and three-point shooters, off-ball game, rebounding and paint movement, gravity fit well with wing, all-time foul, draw rate, no outside game whatsoever. <laughs> Big man in I mean, NBA he did history. it at all. A uh, high level shot blocker with a position in pace slash size. So, uh, strong man defender, low motor, plus super stationary in paint. Not quick to help. Easy to stretch and pick and roll but with a jump shot, a jump shooting big man. And gives him a strong argument as the most dominant big man ever. He's not, though. For Wilt shits on him. Uh, Bill Russell shits on him. Hakeem is the only thing that's that you can consider close to him. I, and I still got Hakeem better than him. I have Kareem better than him. I have Will Chamberlain better than him. I have Bill Russell better than him. Uh, and Hakeem. Like, he, he's, yes. The only time he, he, I guarantee you the times where he was picking up on on uh, the perimeter and shit like that. Like, really clamping down. Like, Kobe-style Dexter, 94 feet, 2-4 two, two, RP Kobe. Hope you out there bullying and shit. Dexter, not saying. Uh, is most likely in the beginning of the game. So, let's be real. He wasn't doing that fourth quarter when it really mattered. He was probably on that stationary bullshit. Dexter, not saying. Uh, in my opinion, bro, the most disappointing player, either him or KD, because if KD didn't do that, realistically, they would have got at least like one, maybe two chips. And if he got that shit naturally, he would be, in my opinion, he would be top five ever, easily, without a doubt. Or him, if he just locked in and he was in a, a lazy fuck, he fell in, he fell in love with what came with the game. He fell, he fell in love with that. 
e e the externalities of it. Dexter, y'all saying? Like, he, he didn't love the game no more. It was obvious. I mean, of course you got to love the game to be in it that long and uh, to be that good. Of course, you have to love the game, but he didn't love it to the next level. You see what I'm saying? To put him over that hurdle. So, in my opinion, he's, he's the biggest disappointment of all time. Because he, he had the potential to literally be the greatest of all time. But he folded. He folded hard. But that's about it.